Ash Princess, Chapter 2, Traitor The obsidian throne stands on a dais at the center of the round, dome-roofed throne room. The great hulking thing is carved from solid black stone in the shape of flames that appear to kiss whoever sits upon it. It's plain, almost ugly, amid all the gold and grandeur that surrounds it, but it is certainly commanding, and that is what matters. The Calavaxians believed that the throne was drawn forth from the volcanoes of old Calavaxia, and left here in Astria for them by their gods, ensuring that they would one day come and save the country from its weak and willful queens. I remember a different story about the Astrian fire god, Husa, who loved a mortal woman so much he gave her a country and an heir with his blood in her, in her veins. That story whispers through my mind now in a familiar, lilting voice. But, like a distant star you try to look at directly, it's quick to fade if I focus on it. It's better left forgotten, anyway. It's safer to live only in the present, to be a girl with no past to yearn for, and no future to have ripped away. The thick crowd of courtiers dressed in their finery parts easily for Prince Soren and me as we walk our way toward the Kaiser. Like Cress, the courtiers all wear blue water gems for beauty and clear air gems for grace. So many that to look at them is almost blinding. There are others as well, red fire gems for warmth golden yellow earth gems for strength. I scan the room. Amid a sea of pale blonde Calavaxians, Ion stands out in his place off to the side of the throne. He's the only other Astrian not in chains, but he's a hardly a welcome sight. After the siege, he turned himself over to the Kaiser and begged for his life offering his services as an air guardian. Now, the Kaiser keeps him around to use as a spy in the capital and as a healer for the royal family. And for me, after all, I'm not as much fun to beat if I black out from the pain. Ion, who once swore himself to our gods and my mother, uses his gift to heal me only so the Kaiser's men can break me again and again and again. His presence is an unspoken threat. He's rarely allowed at court functions. He usually only appears during one of my punishments. If the Kaiser intended to have me beaten, he would want to do so somewhere more public. He hasn't ruled it out, though, which is why Ion is here. The Kaiser aims a pointed look at Soren, who drops my arm and melts into the crowd, leaving me alone under the weight of his father's stare. I'm tempted, I'm tempted to cling to him, to anyone, so I won't have to be alone. But I'm always alone. I should be used to it by now, though I don't think it's the kind of thing a person ever gets used to. The Kaiser leans forward in his seat, cold eyes glinting in the sunlight that pours from the stained glass roof. He looks at me the way he might a squashed bug that dirtied the bottom of his shoe. I stare at the days instead, at the flames carved there. Not angering the Kaiser is what keeps me alive. He could have killed me a thousand times in the last decade, and he hasn't. Isn't that kindness? There you are, Ash Princess. To anyone else, the greeting might sound pleasant, but I flinch. There is always a trick with the Kaiser, a game to play, a thin line to balance on. I know from experience that if he is playing at kindness now, cruelty can't be far behind. 
standing at his side with her hands clasped in front of her and her head bowed his wife kaiserin ankh lets her milky eyes dart up through sparse blonde lashes to find mine a warning that makes the python coil tighter around my stomach you requested my presence your highness i ask dropping into a curtsy so deep i am almost flat against the ground even after a decade my bones still protest the posture my body remembers even when the rest of me forgets that i am not made for curtsying before the caesar can answer a guttural cry sat uh, sorry a guttural cry shatters the still air when i rise i notice a man standing to the left of the throne held in place between two guards rusted chains are wrapped around his gaunt legs arms and neck so tightly they cut into his skin his clothes are tattered and blood drenched and his face is a mottled mess of broken bones and torn skin beneath the blood he's clearly astrian with tawny skin black hair and deep set eyes he looks much older than me though it's impossible to say exactly how old he is with all the damage that's been done to him he is a stranger but his dark eyes search mine as if he knows me imploring begging and i rake through my memories who could this be and what does he want from me i have nothing for him nothing left for anyone then the world shifts beneath my feet i remember those eyes from another lifetime set in a gentle face a decade younger and unbloodied memories surge forward even as i try to press them down i remember him standing at my mother's side whispering something in her ear ear to make her laugh I remember his arms coming around me as he lifted me up in the air so I could pick an orange from a tree. I remembered how he smiled at me like we shared a secret. I push back those thoughts and focus instead on the broken man standing before me. There is one man always mentioned in connection with the rebellions. One man who has a hand in every move made against the Kaiser. one man whose name alone is enough to send the caesar into a wild-eyed rage that leaves me whipped so hard i have to stay in bed for days one man whose acts of defiance have caused me so much pain but who has been my one spark of hope when i dare let myself imagine there is an after to these infernal years no wonder the caesar is so happy He's finally caught the last of Astrea's guardians and my mother's closest guard, MP Leo. My queen, he says. His voice carries so that everyone gathered in the silent throne room hears his treason. I shrink back from his words. No, no, no. I want to tell him I am no one's queen. I am Lady Thora, Princess of Ashes. I am no one. It takes me a moment to realize he's speaking Astrian, speaking forbidden words once used to address my mother. My mother. In another life, I was another girl, another kind of princess. That girl was told that one day she would be a queen. but she never wanted that to be true after all being queen meant living in a world where her mother was no longer existing and that had been unfathomable but that girl had died a decade ago there is no help for her now the man lurches weighted down by his chains he's too weak to make it to the door but he doesn't even try for it instead he topples to the ground at my feet fingers grasping the hem of my dress and staining the pale yellow silk red 
No, please. Part of me wants to drag him up and tell him he's mistaken. Another part wants to shrink away from him because this is such a lovely dress and he's getting blood on it. And yet, another wants to scream at him that his words are going to ruin us both. But at least he will have the mercy of death. He refused to speak to anyone but you, Kaiser Corbin Nian says in an acid voice. Me? My heart is beating so hard in my chest that I'm surprised the whole court can't hear it. Every eye in the room is on me. Everyone is waiting for me to slip, desperate for the slightest hint of rebellion so that they can watch the Kaiser beat it out of me again. I will not give it to them. I will not anger the Kaiser, and he will keep me alive. I repeat the mantra to myself again and again, but the words have grown limp. The Kaiser leans forward on his throne, eyes bright. I've seen that look too often before. It haunts my nightmares. He's a shark that has caught the scent of blood in the water. Don't you know him? This is the Kaiser's favorite kind of question to ask, the kind without a right answer. I look back at the man, as if struggling to pr place him, even as his name screams through my mind. More memories come and I force them back. The Kaiser is watching me carefully, waiting for any sign that I am not under his thumb. But I cannot look away from this man's eyes. In that other life, I loved him. He was my mother's most trusted guardian, and, according to just about everyone, my blood father. Though even my mother couldn't say that for certain. I remember searching his face for simili simi similarities to my own after I heard the rumor for the first time, but I found nothing conclusive. His nose had the same slope, and his hair curled around his ears in the same way mine did, but I looked far too much like my mother to be sure of anything. That was before, though, when my eyes were childishly wide and shapeless, impossible to place on my mother's face or anyone else's. Now, the resemblance is so clear it hits me like a knife to my gut. As a guardian, he would travel often to keep the country safe with his fire magic, but he always returned with sweets and toys and new stories for me. I often fell asleep on his lap, my hand clutching the fire gem that always hung around his neck. Its magic would buzz through me like a lullaby, singing me to sleep. When my mother died and the world I knew turned to dust, I waited for him to save me. That hope waned with every guardian's head the Kaiser had piked in the square, but it never disappeared. I still heard whispers about Ampelio's rebellions, and those kept my hope alive. Even after all the other guardians fell, few and far between as they were, I clung to them. As long as he was out there, as long as he was fighting, I knew he would save me. I never let myself imagine, even in my worst nightmares, that I would see him like this. I tried to empty my mind, but it's futile. Even now, a dim hope flickers in my heart that this day will have a happy ending, that we will see another sunrise together, free. It's a stupid, dangerous hope, but it burns all the same. Tears sting my eyes, but I cannot let them fall. He doesn't wear his gem now. Taking it was the first thing the Kaiser's men would have done when they captured him. For an untrained courtier, a single gem can barely provide enough warmth to keep them comfortable on a winter's night. But Ampelio was blessed. 
one gem was all he would need to burn this palace to the ground. This is the famed guardian, Ampelio, the Kaiser says, drawing out each word mockingly. You must remember him. He's been sowing treason throughout the mines, trying to rally them against me. He even instigated the riot in the air mine last week. The Thine found him nearby and brought him in. Wasn't it an earthquake that incited the riot? The words slipped out before I can stop them. They don't feel like my words, really. Or rather, they don't feel like Thora's. Kaiser Corbinian's jaw clenches and I recoil, readying for a strike. That doesn't come. Yet. Caused by him we suspect, in order to rally more people to your cause, he says with disgust. I have a retort for that too, but I bite it back and let confusion cloud my features. My cause, your highness? I wasn't aware that I had a cause. His smile sharpens. The one seeking to, as they restore you to your rightful place as Queen of Estria. I swallow. This conversation is taking an entirely new d direction, and I'm not sure what to make of it. I think I'd almost prefer the whip to whatever new game this is. My eyes drop to the ground. I'm not anyone's queen, and there is no Astria anymore. I am lady now, by your highness's mercy, and a princess only of ashes. This is my rightful place, and the only one I desire. I can't look at Ampelio as I recite the line that has been burned into my heart over the years. I've said it so often the words have stopped meaning anything, but saying it now in front of him causes shame to run through my veins. The Kaiser nods. I said as much, but Astrians are stubborn old mules. The throne room erupts into laughter. I laugh too, but it is a sound wrenched from my gut. The Kaiser turns to Ampelio, his expression a mockery of sympathy. Come and bow before me, mule. Tell me where I can find your rebels, and you can spend the rest of your days in one of the mines. He grins at the broken man still lying at my feet. Agree, I want to yell. Pledge your loyalty to him. Survive. Do not anger the caser and he will keep you alive. These are the rules. I bow before no one but my queen, Ampelio whispers, tripping over the hard edges of the Calavaxian language. Despite his low voice, his words carry throughout the room, followed by gasps and murmurs from the court. He raises his voice. Long live Queen Theodosia Iren Huzara. Something shatters within me, and everything I've held back, every memory I've repressed, every moment I've tried to forget, it all comes rushing forward, and I can't stop it this time. Theodosia. It's a name I haven't heard in ten years. Theodosia. I hear my mother saying it to me, stroking my hair, kissing my forehead. You are old people's only hope, Theodosia. And Pelio always called me Theo, no matter how my nanny Bertie chided him for it. I was his princess, she said and Theo was the name of a dirt-streaked ragamuffin. He never listened, though. I might have been his princess, but I was something more as well. He was supposed to save me, but he never did. I've been waiting for ten years for someone to come for me, 
and Empelio was the last scrap of hope I had. Maybe he'll answer to you, princess? The Kaiser says. My shock is dim, drowned out by the sound of my name echoing again and again in my mind. I... I couldn't pre presume to have that power, your highness, I manage. His mouth purses in an expression I know all too well. The Kaiser is not a man to be refused. This is why I keep you alive, isn't it? To assist as a liaison to bullheaded Astrian scum. The Kaiser is kind to spare me, I think. But then I realize, once again, that he doesn't spare me out of kindness. He keeps me alive to use me as a leverage against my people. My thoughts are growing bolder now, and though I know they are dangerous, I can no longer quiet them. And for the first time, I don't want to. I have been waiting for ten years to be saved, and all I have to show for it is a scarred back and countless dead rebels. With Ampelio caught, there is nothing more the Kaiser can take from me. We both know he is not merciful enough to kill me. May I speak Astrian? I ask the Kaiser. He might feel more at ease. The Kaiser waves a hand and slumps back into his chair. So long as it gets me answers. I hesitate before dropping to my knees in front of Ampelio, taking his shredded hands in mine. Even though the Astrian language is forbidden, some of the courtiers here must understand it. I doubt the Kaiser would let me speak it otherwise. Are there others? I ask him. The words sound unnatural in my mouth, though Astrian was the only language I spoke until the Calavaxians came. They pried it away from me, made it illegal to speak. I can't remember the first time an Astrian word passed my lips, but I still know the language, somewhere deeper than thought, as if it's embedded in my very bones. Still, I have to struggle to keep the sounds soft-edged and long, unlike the halting and throaty speech of the Calovaxians. He hesitates before nodding. Are you safe? I have to pause a moment before speaking, safe as a ship in a cyclone. The Astrian word for cyclone, signok, is so close to the word for harbor, signak, that only a practiced ear could understand, but one might. The thought is paralyzing, but I push past it. Where are the others? I ask him. He shakes his head and drops his gaze from mine. Nowhere, he chokes out, though he draws out the second syllable to sound more like everywhere to lazy ears. That doesn't make any sense. There are fewer Astrians than Calavaxians, only a hundred thousands before the siege. Most are slaves now though there were rumors they were working for some allies in other countries. It's been too long since I've spoken Astrian. I must have mistranslated. Who? I press. Ampelio sticks his gaze to the hem of my skirt and shakes his head. Today is done. The time has come for little birds to fly. Tomorrow is near. The time is here for old crows to die. My heart recognizes the words before my mind does. They are part of an old Astrian lullaby. My mother sang it to me, and so did my nanny. Did he ever sing it to me himself? Give him something and he'll let you live, I say. Ampelio laughs, but it quickly turns into a wheeze. He coughs and wipes his mouth with the back of his hand. It comes away bloody. 
what life would it be at the mercy of a tyrant? It would have been easy enough to slur together a pair of consonants and make the Astrian word for tyrant sound like the one for dragon, the symbol of the Calavaxian royal family. But Ampelio spits out the word with enough emphasis, directing it at the Kaiser, so that even those who don't speak a word of Astrian can understand his meaning. The Kaiser leans forward in his chair, fingers gripping the arms of the throne so tightly they turn white. He gestures to one of the guards. The guards draw his draws his sword and step towards steps toward Ampelio's prone form. He presses the blade to the back of Ampelio's neck, drawing blood, before lifting the sword again to ready the killing strike. I've seen this done too many times to other rebels or slaves who disrespect their masters. The head never comes off on the first swing. I ball myself into a fist in the material of my dress to keep from reaching out to shield him. There is no saving him now. I know that, but I cannot fathom it. Images swim before my eyes, and I see the knife drawing across my mother's throat. I see slaves whipped until the life leaves their bodies. I see guardians' heads on pikes in the capital square until the crap crows take them apart. I've seen people hanged for going against the Kaiser, for having the courage to do what I haven't. Run, I want to tell him. Fight, beg, bargain, survive. But Ampelio doesn't flinch from the blade. The only move he makes is to reach out and tether himself to my ankle. The skin of his palm is rough and scarred and sticky with blood. The time is here for old crows to die. But I can't let the Kaiser take another person from me. I can't watch Empilio die. I can't. No! The voice forces its way through the fractured bits of me. No? The Kaiser's softly spoken word echoes in the silence and raises goosebumps down my spine. My mouth is dry, and when I speak, my voice rasps. You offered him mercy if he spoke, your highness. He did speak. The Kaiser leans forward. Did he? I may not speak Astrian, but he didn't seem particularly forthcoming. The words flow before I could stop them. He had only half a dozen comrades left after all your great efforts to destroy them. He believes the remaining men and women were killed in the earthquake in the air mine. But if any survived, they are supposed to meet him just south of the Engelamar ruins. There is a cluster of cypress trees there. There is at least a fraction of truth in that. I used to play in those trees every summer when my mother took her annual tour of the town that had been leveled by an earthquake the year before I was born. Five hundred people that died that day. Until the siege, the greatest tragedy Astria had ever faced. The Kaiser tilts his head and watches me too closely, as if he can read my thoughts like words on a page. I want to cower, to force myself to hold his gaze, to believe my lie. After what feels like hours, he motions to the guard next to him. Take your best men, there's no telling what magic the heavens have. The guards nod and hurried from the room. I am glad to keep my face impassive, even while I want to sweep with relief. But when the Kaiser turns his cold eyes back on me, that relief turns hard and sinks to the pit of my stomach. Mercy, he says quietly, is an Astrian virtue. It is what makes you weak. 
But I hope we saved you from that. Perhaps blood will always win out in the end. He snaps his fingers and the guard forces the hilt of his iron sword into my hands. It's so heavy that I struggle to lift it. The earth gems glint in the light and their power makes my hands itch. It's the first time since the siege that I've been allowed to handle any kind of gem or any kind of weapon, for that matter. Once, I would have welcomed it, anything to make me feel like I had a little bit of power. But instead, my stomach lurches as I look at Empilio lying at my feet and realize what Kaiser expects me to do. I shouldn't have spoken up. I shouldn't have tried to save him, because there was something worse than watching the light leave the eyes of the only person I have left in the world. It's driving the sword into him myself. My stomach twists at the thought and bile rises into my throat. I grip the sword, struggling to box myself up again and bury Theodosia even deeper before I end up with a sword at my throat as well. But it can't be done this time. Everything feels too much, hurts too badly, hates too fiercely to be contained now. Perhaps sparing your life was a mistake. His voice is casual, but it makes the threat all the clearer. Traitors receive no pardons from me or the gods. You know what to do. I barely hear him. I barely hear anything. Blood pounds in my ears, blurring my vision and my thoughts until all I can see is Empilio lying at my feet. Father, is this really necessary? Prince Sauron steps forward. The alarm in his voice surprises me, but so does the strength behind it. No one has ever contradicted the Kaiser. The court is as surprised as I am, and they break their silence with whispers that are only interrupted when the Kaiser slams his head against the arm of the throne. Yes, he hisses, leaning forward. His cheeks are a vicious red, though whether it's anger at his son or embarrassment at being questioned, it's difficult to say. It is necessary, and let it be a lesson to you as well, Sodden. Mercy is what lost the Astrians their country, but we are not so weak. The word weak falls like a curse. To the Calovaxians, there is no worse insult. Prince Sauron flinches from it, his own cheeks coloring as he takes a step back, eyes downcast. At my feet, Ampilio shudders, his grip on my ankle twitching. Please, my queen, he says in Astrian. I am not your queen, I want to scream. I am your princess, and you were supposed to save me. Please, he says again, but there is nothing I can do for him. I have seen dozens of men before him executed for far less than this. It was foolish to think that he would be spared. Even if the information I gave had been true, I could beg the Kaiser until my throat was raw and it wouldn't do any good. It would only end with a blade at my back as well. Please, he says again before launching into a rapid Astrian that I struggle to keep up with. Or he will kill you too. It is time for the after to welcome me. Time to see your mother again. But it is not your time yet. You will do this. You will live. You will fight. And I understand. I almost wish I didn't. His blessing is its own kind of curse. No, I can't do it. I can't kill a man. I can't kill him. 
I'm not the Kaiser. I'm not the Thine. I'm not Prince Soren. I'm... Something shifts deep inside me. Theodosia. Ampelio called me. It's a strong name, the one my mother gave me. It's the name of a queen. It doesn't feel like a name I deserve, but here I stand, alone. If I am to survive, I must be strong enough to live up to it. I must be Theodosia now. My hands begin to shake as I lift the sword. Ampelio is right. Someone will do it, whether it's me or one of the Kaiser's guards. But I will make it quicker, easier. It is better to have your life ended by someone who hates you. Wait, sorry. I mean, is it someone, is it better to have your life ended by someone who hates you or someone who loves you? Through the thin, torn shirt he wears, more red than white now, I feel the vertebrae of his spine. The blade fits below his shoulders between two protruding ribs. It will be like cutting steak at dinner, I tell myself, but I already know it won't be like that at all. He turns his head so that his eyes meet mine. There is something familiar in his gaze that wrings my heart in my chest and makes it impossible to breathe. There is no doubt left in me. This man is my father. You are your mother's child, he whispers. I tear my eyes away from him and focus on the Kaiser instead, holding his gaze. Bend not, break not. I say clearly, quoting the Calovaxian motto before I plunge the sword into Ampelio's back, cutting through skin and muscle and bone to strike his heart. His body is so weak, so mangled already, that it's almost easy. Blood gushes up, covering my dress. Ampelio gives a twitch and a shallow cry before going limp. His hand slips away from my ankle, though I feel the bloody handprint left behind. I withdraw the sword and pass it back to the guard, numb. Two other guards step forward to drag the body away, leaving a trail of slick red in its wake. Take the body to the square and hang it for everyone to see. Anyone who tries to move it will join him. The Kaiser says before turning back to me. His smile pools in the pit of his in the pit of my stomach like oil. Good girl. The blood soaks my dress, stains my skin. Ampelio's blood, my father's blood. I curtsy before the Kaiser my body moving without my mind's consent. Clean yourself up, Lady Thora. There will be a banquet tonight to celebrate the fall of Astria's greatest rebel. And you, my dear, will be the guest of honor. I drop into another shallow curtsy and bow my head. Of course, Your Highness, I look forward to it. The words don't feel like my own. My mind is churning so deeply I'm surprised I can find words at all. I want to scream. I want to cry. I want to take the bloody sword back and stab it into Kaiser's chest, even if I die in the process. It is not your time yet. Ampelio's voice whispers through my mind. You will live. You will fight. The words don't bring me any comfort. Ampelio is dead, and with him, my last hope of being rescued.